Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining this week's Soil Health webinar, which uh, will focus on the return on investing in soil health with our guest speaker, Rick Clark. Um, this is being, or this is sponsored today by the North Central Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. Um, and I have the website there, North Central SARE strengthens communities and um, increases producers profitability and improves environment through grants and education. So if you're interested in learning more about them, we have that link for you. Um, so before we get started, if you wanna practice using the chat um, to talk with us, uh, go ahead and type in there your answer to this question, which practices to improve soil health have given you the biggest return on investment do you feel like? And Rick's gonna talk about his experience. Um, so this is being recorded and I will send a link to the recording to all of you on Monday morning. Um, and you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel if you wanna get an uh, alert as soon as that's uploaded over the weekend. So today's speaker is Rick Clark. Rick is a fifth generation farmer from Williamsport, Indiana. And the main goal on Rick's farm is to build soil health and achieve balance with mother nature. Rick has developed and is consistently improving a systematic approach to regenerative farming. The farm strives to be a low cost input produ producer while maintaining an increase in yield year after year. Uh, the farm is 100% non-GMO, 100% no-till, and 100% cover crop. And he is currently transitioning um, all acres of the farm to organic. He's most proud of developing a system of organic farming that utilizes no tillage. Rick suppresses the weeds with the use of cover crops. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Rick. Thank you so much for uh, being with us this morning. Excited to hear from you. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here today presenting at the Ohio State University Extension Soil Health Series. I think this is a tremendous thing to do and, and I always enjoy coming to Ohio or speaking uh, at events that Ohio is putting on because you folks are, are what I would consider very progressive. So it's always been an honor and pleasure. Thank you. Um, Okay, I like to start with this slide now. Uh, this is kind of a uh, of a starter here of getting things pr uh, prepared for what needs to happen in the future. You've got to have the support of everyone that's on your team. And, and that's your, I don't call uh, them employees, I call them team members and family members. Uh, it takes that support of everyone uh, to make this a successful journey. And the two brightest spots in 2020 are those two beautiful grandchildren there. So uh, 2020 wasn't at least a total wipeout. It, it, it did have a lot of good things to it. Uh, I did graduate from Purdue University. I am a fifth generation farmer. Uh, I've been practicing now for about 37 years. Uh, beautiful wife, Carol, for 32 years, two beautiful daughters, Jessica and Rachel. Uh, father, uh, Richard, is on the farm still. He's, uh, he'll be 87 this year. He, he doesn't do much, but he does drive around and make sure that we're all still doing something. So uh, it's good to still have him around. He's been my, my mentor and, and he's taught me how to think. And, and you've got to be able to think in this, in this systematic approach that we're trying to do. Uh, nephew Aaron is on the farm. Uh, we've been no-tilling soybeans for 17 years, corn, no-tilling corn for 12, cover crops for 12, and farming green for 10. And I'm going to get into that just a little bit deeper in just a little bit. Um, the, the system that we have in place right now, it's, it's a six crop system. And, and I don't call it a cash crop rotation because there is no real rotation. It's, it's a system and we're trying to just maximize what we can do with, with each growing season. Um, most of our neighbors, if not all of them, have two crops they plant, and that's corn and soybeans. We, and, and not in any order, we have six now. We are uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, yellow field peas, and livestock. And the plus one is what I call a regen. And regen is when you take uh, an acre and take it out of production and you then give it 
full attention. You, you start with a cool season cocktail, you then roll into a warm season cocktail, and you then will be building to uh, putting that final cocktail out that'll be for the cash crop for next growing season. But what I like about this regen, there's way more positive to it than just building soil health and, 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 and taking care of that land. It gives the Northern states opportunities to get cover crops established when otherwise they wouldn't have the time. And it's very hard to get a warm season package established in anywhere in the United States. So once you, you can get yourself to the point of where you can get a regen, then you can, you can really start to, to take advantage of the cover crops. And I also mentioned in there that we have wheat in the rotation and that's another way to get a cocktail. Uh, we do not double crop beans after wheat. We take that advantage of time to again, get a cover crop out. Um, we currently uh, have 1200 acres certified organic and the remainder of the farm is in transition, but don't worry, this is not gonna be an organic presentation. Uh, a lot of the things that we're, that we're doing in the organic, you folks can do all the way up until the point of taking everything away. We, we've not used any starter fertilizer, fungicide, seed treatments or insecticide for seven years. We've not applied any P, uh, phosphorus or potassium in seven years and no ag lime in seven years. Um, now, with all this mentioned, we're trying, we're trying to do this as naturally as we possibly can with mother nature. We have not applied any nitrogen two years on the corn and we're not planning on doing it again for the growing season of 21. So the only spot on our farm that we're using manure right now is on the alfalfa fields that are being clipped every 25 or six days and hauled away as total removal. Those are the only fields that are getting solid manure back and broadcast on at about 10 ton to the acre because we just cannot handle that kind of nutrient removal without bringing some of that manure back. Now, I mentioned we're organic, but I feel like we're way beyond organic. We are doing this with zero tillage, no tillage. So cover crops and cash, uh, cash crop canopy are the weed suppression tools. Here's my definition of farming green. Planting the cash crop of corn and soybeans into a living, growing green cover crop and termination may not occur for up to 30 days, but typically it's gonna happen within three to five. Now, in this particular video, I show this because I want you to understand that we're planting corn here. You can plant corn into, into five foot tall rye if you understand what's going on. And I'm, I've got a chart that'll show this in a little bit, but the, the cereal rye is sequestering a tremendous amount of nutrients and those nutrients are not available for the corn plant and it will suffer in its early growing stages. So we need to move the nutrient package forward a little bit, V2, V3, we need to get it some nitrogen. Okay, that's the same field right there because what we did, now we don't do this anymore. This is what we used to do. So these are things that if you're still you know, you still want to use chemicals or you still want to use uh, um, fertilizers, plant corn into that tall rye. We rolled this particular field down with the roller crimper, eliminated the burn down pass. And this is what we're looking at, at, at now we're closing the row out at V6, V7. And there's very little weed pressure. So these are things that we can do to start reducing the chemical load and start building soil health. We wanna maximize what the cover crop was intended to do. We, were, we are spending sometimes upwards of $40 an acre on cover crops packages. And the last thing I wanna do is go out on the first warm day of spring and burn everything to the ground. We've gotta let these go further into maturity and let them sequester their nutrients. Cereal grains are tremendous sequesters of nutrients. Now, I do not buy into the fact that the allopathic effect of cereal rye is, is affecting the corn growth. I do not buy into that. I buy into the fact that the, the cereal rye is sequestering 
most of the nutrients that are available for that corn plant to, to thrive and grow in its early, in its early growth period. So let, let me go ahead and continue my thought there. So I think what's also happening here is since the cereal rye is such a tremendous sequester, it is also taking away the fuel that the early germinating weeds need. And it buckles them at, the, at their knees. And then as the cereal rye grows and canopies the sun out, those weeds can no longer survive. And that typically holds true. We do not have very many broadleaf issues in this system early in the growing season. Okay, so with that being said, we want, my, my rule here is 70-30, okay? 70% of weed suppression is coming from the cover crop biomass, the thatch, the mulch, whatever you want to call what we lay down with that I and J roller crimper, we are getting 70% of our weed suppression from that. And we're getting the other 30% weed suppression from the cash crop canopy. Now we are on 20 inch row spacing corn and 20 inch row spacing soybeans. So we've got to get these crops out of this biomass and we've got to get them to canopy as quickly as we can. Nitrogen fixing. If you've planted a legume package, let that package go well into the middle of May and you will see in just a couple slides the power of clover if you let it go further into its growing cycle. Growing carbon. This is all the buzz now. Everybody's wanting you to sell them carbon so they can take your carbon credits and offset someone who, who needs those credits. Well, these are the practices that we need to learn to start doing because this is what qualifies you for getting paid on those credits. You know, no-till, cover crop, reducing inputs, reducing chemicals. All of these things we're going to talk about today are going to feed into that carbon market. Now, we've not done anything with the carbon markets yet. I still think they're kind of young. We need to make sure both parties are, are being represented fairly. So I'm being patient and, and waiting because things are changing rapidly right now. Erosion control. I don't care where you live, there is erosion. Wind erosion, water erosion. Increased pounds of biomass. That's the world that I live in now. We need that mat to suppress the weeds and the only way to get there is biomass. And we need thousands of pounds, six, seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 pounds. Feeding the microbes. We, we, we don't know what all the microbes are below our feet. We only know a small percentage of what exists down there. So let's give them diversity with these cocktails and let's give them cash crop rotations and let's continue to feed them. Armor the soil, this is so important. It is important that we protect the soil profile from the beating of the sun coming down and just baking everything out. Limit evaporation. This is so important when it gets hot and dry in July and August. If you have this armor on the soil and you've worked so hard to build organic matter and, and to increase water infiltration rates and, and increase aggregate stability and tilth and water holding capacity, take advantage of that. Keep your profile covered so that when it gets hot, your, your moisture is not leaving the profile and going up, it's staying in the profile and giving that availability of moisture to your cash crop. Suppress weeds. I've already talked about this. This, I'm telling you, I'm over here over on the way over to the right, okay? I'm on this island. I'm this wacky guy from Indiana. That's fine. You don't need to come over here with me. I'd love to have you. I could use the company but there are so many spots you can fall into the curve here and, and start to at least slow down or eliminate burn downs. Here's the power of cereal rye. Okay, let me set this up. This was a corn field in the fall. We, uh, we no-till drilled 80 pounds of Elbon cereal rye. It, it grew in the fall 
and then it went dormant, came out in the spring and started to grow. And we took a, a sample at 12 inch. So what we do is we go out in the field, we measure off a two foot by two foot square. We clip everything at ground level, put it in a bag and send it to the lab. And they will send you back these results. So now this is going to be a, be a soybean field in the spring, okay. So a couple of things I wanna look at here. I mentioned earlier that I don't buy into the allopathic effect of corn. I more buy into the fact of sequestration of nutrients. Look at the nitrogen column in that 12 inch tall rye. And I'm gonna to venture to say that most rye that's planted as a cover crop is terminated at this 12 inch rye because most folks don't wanna let it get out of control. So that's fine, it's done some good but look at the amount of nitrogen that's already sequestered into that above uh, ground plant, 82 units of N. The 0060 column we wanna look at, that's potash. I've already made the conversion, 133 pounds. Biomass 2000, that's not good enough yet. Four days. In four days, it went from 12 inch rye to 18 inch rye and look at the numbers now. The nitrogen went to 120 pounds. You're now beginning to see why corn struggles in cereal rye, but that's fine because what we're going to do is apply some ammonium sulfate if you're not organic. So when we used to do this, we would apply 150 pounds of uh, ammonium sulfate. I like ammonium sulfate because the ammonium is more stable and there's also sulfur in that product. Now, again, this is, these are the days before organic. I can't do this now anymore because I can't get this nitrogen out there. The biomass has doubled. Uh, now about 10 to 14 days, we've gone to 28 inch tall rye. The nitrogen is still going up and look at the potash now, 281 pounds, and we're now up to 6,800 pounds of biomass. We are getting there now. We're where we need to be. Okay, thank goodness I had my brain hooked on because these are tremendous numbers, but what's that really mean to the cash crop? I came back in two months and took another sample. Look at what has been released of the potash. You can do the math there, 281 minus 65. It's, it's well over 200 pounds of, of potash has been released into the profile that in my opinion is now available for the cash crop of soybeans to take up as it needs and make its, its life very, very easy from here forward. Now the nitrogen has come down some and, and the, the DAP or the O460 has not come down any. So once we understand what's happening here, we again, we know what we think we need to do for this and look at the biomass. It's been cut almost in half in that two month period. So that's to my 70, 30 rule because by now that biomass is probably starting to get holes in it and if you're not, if your cash crop is not canopied, sunlight's going to get down and guess what's coming? Weeds. So this all has to kind of work um, in a holistic, in a holistic system. What drives our system? It's all about building soil health. I've spent years to get where we are today and I'm not going to throw it all away with a, with a pass of a pyrethroid to target one single species because you're going to kill thousands of beneficials and I'm not going to step backwards. Um, when you live in the organic world, there's an organization, uh, the acronym is OMRI, O-M-R-I. It's an organization that decides what products can be approved to apply to a certified organic acre. And we are using nothing. We don't use even any of those products. I'm trying to do this as natural and as easy and as free as possible. So there may be products out there that could target an infestation of say armyworm, but I'm not going to use it 
because I just don't want to take the chance of harming other beneficial species. Diversification is critical in this. We have to get multiple species planted as many times of the year as we possibly can. Cash crop rotation. I told you we are now up to six things we can rotate through. So that is so critical. We're trying not to have corn on an acre at least for four or five years. Data collection. It's not only collecting data. We all collect the data. Our phones do a tremendous job of collecting data. It's what do you do with that data? Do you use it to your advantages? We have to start thinking about data collection and baselining your farm and start moving into these soil health practices. And then when, as you're taking inputs away, you can start to see what benefits are working and which ones are not. Armor the soil, I've already talked about this. Building human health, we do not think about this enough. I am no longer going to have these harmful herbicides, pesticides, insecticides around for the family members or team members to be, to be around and touch, breathe, whatever. It's, we're taking this stuff away. It's, they're too harmful. There's too many health issues involved and we're just not, we're just not doing it anymore. So we have to be thinking about the human health aspect. Being a good steward, that word is self-explanatory. It's way more than building soil health. If you want to be a good steward, if you've got tile holes on your farm, fix them. If you've got washes on your farm, build waterways and fix them. That's being a good steward. ROI, return on investment. As, as inputs go down and yields go up, you are returning on investment. And that is also my very simple and easy metric of soil health. As, as inputs go down and yields go up, how could you not be building soil health? It's that simple, folks. Don't make this hard. Those are two metrics that are very easy to track and it's repeatable. Now, the one thing you do not see on this screen is yield. Yield does not drive our system. I know I went to Purdue, but I do know that you have to know what your yield is to calculate ROI. I know that but that's where it ends right there. Because if you do all of these steps here, the yield will come along. Balance, this is all about balance is what I'm talking about here. The, the symbiotic relationship of mother nature, the reason why we've been able to pull away all of those inputs and, and the reason why we can plant non-GMO corn without any insecticide is because we are heading toward balance. Let me, let me go into a couple of examples. Predator to prey. Whatever organism preys on corn rootworm is being, uh, is prevalent in our profile because we have eliminated the salts and the acids and the herbicides that are killing those beneficial organisms that keep things in balance. So once you do this and you get your predator to prey more in balance, you can start to pull these inputs away. Bacteria to fungal. When we started down this journey a long time ago, we did, uh, we started taking uh, the Haney soil health test, Dr. Rick Haney. It's a tremendous soil health test. It will give you this predator, predator to prey relationship. It will give you the bacteria to fungal. It will give you uh, a plethora of things. We do uh, PLFA, we do Solvita, we do so CO2 burst. He will give you a soil health score. It's amazing what you can get from this test. But when we started down this journey and started taking this test, at the beginning, we were a bacterial-based farm, and now that we are heading toward this balance by eliminating all of these harmful inputs, we have shifted to a fungal-based farm, and that's exactly where you want to be. The arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi are imperative to have 
thriving in this system because they are the communication backbone of the whole microbial network. So if there's any transaction of nutrients or minerals, it has to come through that fungi. So again, this is why I not only stress re removing the inputs, but we have to remove tillage. I know there's gonna be people disagree with me. That's fine. You're entitled to your opinion. I'm entitled to mine. If we are constantly tearing down these microbial biomes with tillage and inputs, and all they're doing is, is, is the, they're, they're spending their whole life building their homes back, they're not doing anything toward building soil health. So we have to stop tearing their, their, their homes down and let them work at peak performance. Change is good. Change is necessary and change is the answer. We have to, you know, I'm not here to criticize the way anybody farms. That's not what I'm about. I'm only here to possibly show you another couple of ways to add something to your current practice. But we have to understand that change is good, okay? Please step out of your comfort zone just a little bit. Okay, it's a picture of the corn row unit. Very simple. There is no row cleaner. There is no no-till coulter but there is a prescription tillage technology STP blade double disc opener. You might want to write that down because this is the best double disc opener blade I have seen. We have, we are heading into year four now on this technology. Um, we plant our corn three inches deep. And what I like about uh, this blade, one of the things I like is it creates a U trough instead of a V slot. So planting that deep, our Keaton firmer can actually touch that kernel of corn we just dropped in, the, in that trough. It eliminates hair pinning. When you are planting into this high of a residue system, you are going to have hair pinning, not with these blades. And the third thing I like is their crumbling effect. As they're rolling through the field, they are crumbling and breaking down the sidewall. And, and, and at the point of even before Steve Martin's spader wheel closing system, the, the seed is almost three quarters of an inch covered with that crumbling dirt down off the sidewall. So it's a tremendous easy setup right there. But, but folks, it takes time to get your soil into the health that it needs to be to be able to run this sleek of a system. Weapon of mass destruction number one against weeds. I do not care what your color or flavor of choice is. I do not care. I do not sell anything. This is the equipment that we have. That piece of equipment is a 1996 model. So we've got to learn how to, you, we, we don't need to go buy all, go buy new equipment. You've probably got something on the farm that will get you started. And then as you get into it and you become more profitable, then you can start getting some equipment that you really want. But it's imperative that we get the cover crops planted and they need to be planted as early in the fall as possible. We have shortened our relative maturity of our cash crop tremendously. Our corn was 110 to 116 day. We're now 98 to 106. Our soybean program used to be 3.2 to 4.2. We are now 1.6 to 2.6. Now let me explain where we are in the world. I should have done that at the beginning, I apologize. West Central Indiana, right on the Illinois-Indiana line, straight east of Champaign, Illinois. So we are right in line with the border between Iowa and Missouri, okay? All of Iowa is north of us, all of Missouri is south of us. So you kind of get a feeling for where we are now. Weapon of mass destruction number two. This is my baby, the INJ 60-foot roller crimper. This is how we terminate cover crops now. This is how we lay down that biomass to start getting us that weed suppression. Gunslinger, this is a cocktail that I came up with uh, that will 
go out in the fall ahead of a, an expected corn crop next spring. Again, this has got to come out early in the region that I live in. This needs to be in the ground the first week of April, period, because you've got to get this kind of growth heading into winter. The haywire oats, the sorghum sudan, and the tillage radish will all three winter kill, and you're left with the Austrian winter peas and the Balanza fixation clover. All right, this, if I was to tweak this any, and, and please do whatever you want with this, add, subtract, whatever you want, I would add five pounds of Valana hairy vetch. I picked Valana because Valana has one of the lowest, if not the lowest, hard seed count percentage in any hairy vetch that I've seen. Now it's not the most cold tolerant, but if you can get this planted early, you can get it to survive. We were checking fields yesterday. Uh, yesterday was what, March the 3rd. And we've just come out of a pretty brutal winter. We can see the hairy vetch coming to life right now. It's 50, it was 52 degrees at home and the hairy vetch is coming. So it's going to work. This is what you will have in the spring if you can get the clover to survive. Look at that sea of blooming fixation clover. That tall, those tall plants that you see are not weeds. They are the Austrian winter peas. Now we're playing around with some different peas. Grassland Oregon has a survivor pea. Uh, Keith Burns at at uh, Green Cover has got a Wyoming pea, and these are, have been bred to survive cold weather. So we're probably going to start experimenting with some of those peas. Now we do have those peas on other testing on the farm, but for this, we're definitely gonna probably implement those peas. But look at that, isn't that beautiful? Now here's the planter, no tilling. You, it's the same row unit I had on the screen a few moments ago. This is some of the best planting you'll ever do, folks. The amount of root system, the fibrous roots that are in this top four inches is unbelievable. So away we go. The power of that fixation clover, same thing. We, we planted this last fall in that first week of September. It grows, it goes dormant, comes out next spring and we go out and we clip a two foot by two foot square and we ship it to the lab. The reason why we do a two foot by two foot square is because you can calculate how much of an acre that area is. And then you can do the math to get to these numbers. This is powerful stuff. On May the 20th, 75 pounds of in. So let's assume, let's move that 75 to 80 so that I can do this math in my head. That's 40 units of in. And, and the price of in right now is 50 cents a unit. So that's $20 an acre. That $20 just paid for this Balanza fixation clover cocktail, okay? So you're now at zero expense. But look at what we're gaining here. Look at June 4th. Look at all these nutrients that are now coming to the surface because of what is happening here through not only the fixation part, but it's sequestration part, okay? Now, let's for a moment assume that you don't wanna live in my world over here where I'm trying to grow the nitrogen we need. Let's stop right here. Again, let's go to easy math, June the 4th, 120 units of N. Let's move it up to 120 so I can do this in my head. That's 60 units of N in my opinion, because we've done this long enough We've taken enough studies, we've done enough testing, half of this nitrogen is available at termination. That's right now. So 60 units of N, let's start taking 60 units out of our synthetic N application and let's start building soil health and let's start reducing inputs and let's start saving money. Okay. Rick, I don't want to plant corn on June 4th. I get that. So how about we go back about six days and let's plant corn between that May 20th and June 4th timeframe. And then let's terminate. If you want to use chemicals, terminate before the corn comes out of the ground and you've picked up now six more days of what can happen. You can see, look at these numbers. 
look at four days from June the 4th to June the 8th. We go to 262 pounds of N, 444 pounds of K2O, and 228 pounds of calcium, and so on and so on. And look at the biomass, 12,700 pounds. We're home here, folks. I told you we're growing our own nitrogen. My rule of thumb on, on corn is you need 0.8 pounds of nitrogen per uh, bushel of yield. And we have to start looking at things as a realistic yield goal. Would I love to, to raise 220 bushel corn? Yes, I would love to. Realistically, in the system that we have in place now, organic, Cover crop, no-till. I mean, folks, this is hard. Realistic yield goal, 140. So 140 times 0 0.8 is, I don't know, 112 or 114 pounds of N. Well, on June 8th, we had 262 pounds, and that's the day we planted this corn. We could have done that same logic I said earlier. We could plant this corn on June the 2nd, and then we could have came in and rolled this all down with the roller crimper right there as the corn was coming to the ground and, <clears throat> excuse me, and gotten our planting date moved up by six days. But the point here is this is powerful stuff. We came back on July 24th to see what was left and look how much has been exhausted. And look at the biomass column. You're starting to see why we, you understand why we need the cash crop canopy. The microbes are burning this up at a huge rate, extremely quick. As you would expect, this is a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 20 to one. I also call this the power of patience because it takes patience to get to this date to plant corn. Look at the organic carbon, 5,200 pounds per acre. You're talking about all these people want to buy carbon credits. Look at the carbon we could be being paid for. This is what that field looked like from a broader picture. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? The power of patience. This is the feed. Uh, this is the fuel or the, I'm sorry. This is how we feed the corn and suppress weeds all at the same time. Okay, no-till. Uh, soybeans, any, we all can do this. Uh, it's May 23rd. This is about the time frame in the region that I live that, that you're going to get the cereal rye at boot stage. Now look at that cereal rye is about four and a half feet tall. It just goes right through the planter. It wiggles itself out and comes right out the back of the planter and away we go. Okay, now, that's what we all can do. And then we all can do this. We're gonna roll crimp. This is the same field. So when I do this, it's the same field. You're gonna see the previous slide, this slide, and the next slide are all the same field. There's the soybeans. They're at V2 growth stage, planted at boot. Now the, the rye here is way past anthesis, but look at this INJ roller. Look at the aggressiveness of those chevrons. And now look at what the beans look like after we roll this flat. Okay, we're after anthesis, but that's fine. As you can see, it's all still laid down. That now is the wheat suppression that needs to hold until we get to cash crop canopy. Same field, July 19th. Look at this. Okay, so I've now shown you how to plant soybeans into rye and eliminate a burn down, and now you scout. If you don't like what you see, then you can go out and do some spot spraying, and we are now drastically reducing our inputs, and we are starting to build soil health, and we're also starting to build a, an, a comfort of getting into this system and getting comfortable with these cover crops, and then start getting more and more creative. Input reductions. I just wanted to show that some of the, what we can do here if we put our mind to it. Okay, we've, we've reduced diesel fuel by almost 50%, but, but that's due to many things. Horsepower reduction is one of the greatest things that will reduce fuel because if you don't have the trackers burning the fuel, you don't need the fuel. 
But the other thing is the fact that we've reduced all the passes. We are trying to do our system now with three passes, a, a drill or a, an air seeder pass of the cover crop in the fall, a no-till planter pass in the spring, and a roller crimper pass right behind that. That's all we're doing. And hopefully that will work. Synthetic end, zero now, map zero, potash zero, lime zero, and chemistry zero. But now these, you gotta remember what I'm trying to do here are averages because there are certain times we may have had a lot of corn acres and not very many soybean acres. So your chemicals change, your, your, your map changes. So these are averages over time. Okay, that same slide before, I've now put those uh, savings into dollar amounts. So diesel fuel savings, 35,000 in 220, MAP 138, 142, 53, and chemistry 240. And I'm being extremely liberal here because I'm not even taking into account labor and I'm not taking into account what all that reduction of machinery means. And we don't have any, we don't have any tillage equipment, all that's sold. So our depreciation schedule has gotten mighty small. So in reality, we are well over a million dollars of, of repeatable savings every single year. But I want this to be conservative because I don't want someone to call me out on this and question what we're doing. This is a very conservative number. And hey, if, if, I'm, if I'm wrong by 50%, we're still saving over $400,000 a year. That's serious money. You can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. Sacrifice yield to maintain soil health. I do it every single day. Eliminate crop insurance. We don't have it anymore. We have a very stable system now. It's taken years to get here. We are closer to balance than we've ever been. We're stable. We have taken no CFAP government subsidy payments. None. I, I do not want to be a hypocrite. I do not want to stand here or present to you today and tell you to take everything away like we've done and then stand there with my hand out wanting a government payment, not doing that. And by the way, it's not a government payment. The, the, the American taxpayer is paying those subsidies. Plant green into living cover crops. We can do this. We've got to let these cover crops go way further into the maturity. Plant beans into 72 inch rye, plant corn into cereal rye. We can do it as now that we understand what's happening with the nutrient sequestration. It's okay to have 12 plans in 20. I think I used every letter of the alphabet. Slow down and look for validations. Park your planter no matter the date. I don't care if your neighbors are running and they get done before you do great. Do you only get on your fields when they're fit to be on? Do not plant corn in April again. I was always taught from both college and my father, I was always taught corn is king. You have to do whatever it takes to get corn planted on time. Do it, do it, do it. Don't worry about beans that are a secondary crop. That's wrong in my mind. By now uh, planting the beans at boot stage for us, that's around that, that April 25th time frame, uh, plus or minus a few days. And, and when you look at the power of that Balanza fixation clover, it's not coming into fruition until well after Mother's Day. So this is all perfect. We're gonna plant our beans first now and get them in a, in a wonderful weather, in a window of time. And then we're gonna park the, the bean planter and switch to corn. And we're going to now plant our corn after Mother's Day. So this all works perfect. Totally eliminate all inputs that includes manure except for the manure that's going on the alfalfa fields because of their total removal. Grow the nitrogen we need with legumes. We've shown the power of the clover. It's, it's worthy. We can start, if you, again, if you don't want to go as radical as we have gone, that's fine. Start using that, that legume, though, to your advantage 
and start reducing your synthetic nitrogen. Regen acres, no cash crop, already talked about that. Certified organic with no tillage, the three pass system. But I can't, I, folks, I cannot stress enough how difficult this is and how dangerous this is. You cannot just go out this spring and flip your whole farm. You've got to ease into this. You've got to take your time and you cannot jeopardize the livelihood of your farm. Start with small acres, 10, 20, 30, 40 acres at a time. Do your testing and see what works on your farm. This is working for us. I cannot guarantee it's gonna work for anybody else. So please be careful. To truly be regenerative, you have to take everything away. And I mean everything. And again, I know there'll be people disagree with me and that's fine. This is the world that I'm gonna live in. I'm 57 years old. I've only got about 15 or 17 more times to do this. And I'm going to make it imperative that the rest of my life of farming is gonna be geared toward making this system even better. It's not even close to being perfected yet, not even close but we're gaining on this every single day. If you are not uncomfortable with what you're doing, then you are not trying hard enough to change. Now, please think about that for just a moment. I don't care if you're a farmer or an accountant or an extension agent, I don't care. If we're just sitting back and not trying anything new, that's not good, that's stagnant, that's, un that's not uncomfortable. I challenge everyone here to get a little uncomfortable. I think you'll like the way it feels. I'm proud to be a farmer, but I am way more proud of the way I farm. I call it regenerative stewardship. Thank you very much and again, I am absolutely honored to be presenting for the Ohio State University Extension today. Uh, thank you so much. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now and we can open it up for questions. And Rick will ask you the first question. Um, do you plant Gunslinger in the fall or spring? Gunslinger? Okay, when we plant when we plant legumes, okay, there's your CCA credits. Um, you can scan through that. I'm, I'm great that you guys are doing that. That's awesome. Um, when we plant a legume in the fall and we plant it early enough in the fall before that first freeze event, it will lay down some deep roots and it will then next spring be thinking about fixing nitrogen and not so much vegetative growth, okay? But if you could not get that planted in the fall and you wanted to frost seed this, it will work, but you're not going to get near the nutrient load that I had on that power of, of fixation slide. Because when you frost seed a legume, it's going to now only think about putting on vegetative growth and not so much root growth. And so your nutrient, there's still a bunch there, but not near the amount. So to answer her que or the question, that slide you saw was planted in the fall, but it can be frost seeded. Okay, our next one, and don't forget to vote on those questions. We'll move those to the top. Have you ever taken a field off of synthetic fertilizer, cold turkey, and switched to using cover crops to sequester nutrients? Yeah, that's hard. Um, no, I've not done that. What When we started our our journey of reducing inputs, what we did instead of taking inputs away, we reduced the amount. For example, if, if, if Roundup's full rate is, I remember now, I think it's 22 ounces, we would start by only applying 12 ounces. And you can still terminate cereal rye in certain situations with 12 ounces of Roundup. So that's the way we started to reduce that input. Same thing with synthetic N. We may have been applying 220 pounds, then we would have gone to 180, then we would have gone to 110 and so on and so on until we eventually got to where we had to eliminate 
because I wanted to go into the organic world. Now, there are organically approved nitrogen sources, but I don't want to use them. So the answer is no, it's not cold turkey. It takes a few years of coming down to get to that total removal. All right, our next one is two parts. How long did you terminate rye prior to planting? And do you have livestock? Is that where your manure source is coming from? Yeah, good question. We do have livestock, uh, but and that is where some of the manure is coming from. But I have a dairy that's four miles out the back door and we can get uh, the solid manure from them. Now, some people say that I'm foolish because with that dairy being there, we've got 2,000 acres that touch their drag line, but I'm no longer taking their liquid gold, as I call it. I, it's just too big of a shock to the system. Now, I know there are, there are dairies and there are livestock producers that need to get rid of manure, and I understand that. So let's try to do this a different way. Instead of going out and dropping 20,000 gallons at a time, let's make a split application Let's have cover crops growing and let's try to split applicate and maybe reduce the total, maybe two eights instead of a of 120. Now, the, the, the cereal rye question is, we try and roll everything after we plant because I'm trying to maximize the benefit of what that cereal rye is doing through its sequestration. So very rarely do we terminate before the planter. Now there are exceptions. In 20, we, had, we were so wet in the spring that by the time we got to some of our fields, it was already at anthesis. So I decided to go ahead and roll the rye down that same morning the planter started planting. So it was kind of the same day, but really we want everything to be after we plant. Okay, thank you. Next one, hopefully this is easy. Are you willing to have visitors come to the farm? We would love to be able to see, feel, and touch. Yeah, it's, um, that's very important. And, and that's, uh, that's awesome that you said those words because that's what I always say. Farmers are touchy feely people. They wanna come, they wanna get down on their hands and knees and they wanna see it and feel it for themselves. Yes, um, I did have my contact information up there uh, if, if, if not, you folks are more than welcome to, to put it back up again. Um, yes, I, I always don't take a phone call because I am kind of busy, but I will return it at some point and love to have people come load a bus up. It's happened many times. We've had buses, uh, two buses of Europeans show up, uh, South Americans. Uh, it just, yes, people come. It's, it's, it's good. It's good to see. All right, this one I think you answered, but we'll re-ask it. Where's your farm located in Indiana? Because if you wait until June to plant corn, you have already lost a lot of yield potential in Ohio. Yep, yep, that, that's exactly true. Um, that's why I think what we could do is I tried to explain, I think we could back up to that later part of May and then wait five or six days for termination and we could still gather quite a bit of the value of that cocktail that we that we planted. Uh, the location that we are is West Central Indiana. We are 15 miles north of Interstate 74, right on the Indiana Illinois line. So we are just a little bit north of Columbus, Ohio, probably 50 miles north of Columbus. Are you inter interceding any cover crops? Not yet, but that is a great choice for the northern states, and I would put northern Ohio into that category. It's a great opportunity to come out at V3, V4, and get a cereal rye established and get it started and get ready for that soybean crop that's probably going to come the next year. Um, there's other things that I am playing with, though, that I don't know if you technically could call them interceding, but what we are doing is we are broadcasting cover crop over the top the same day we plant. So the theory there is that that cover crop cocktail is gonna lay on top of the ground and it won't germinate until the next rain event, but this, the corn that you've now planted 
at three inches deep is in moisture and it's going to germinate and start to grow. And then hopefully at V3, that cocktail that you broadcast is now starting to grow. So it's kind of like an interceding, but it's a delayed reaction. Now, this is only going to work in environments that get some rain in the spring. So if you're in the high plains, for example, in Oklahoma, probably not going to work very well because there's not going to be enough rain. But Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Iowa, Illinois, Kentucky, yes, I think. And, and we're, we've been doing this with buckwheat. And I really like buckwheat, but buckwheat is so hard because any cold snap, I mean, a sniff of cold weather and, and buckwheat's over. So... Yes, I like I like the interceding idea. I think it's valid for uh, Ohio. Yes, most definitely. And also relay cropping. There's a lot of that going on now. We're, the folks are planting uh, wheat and soybeans on like 30 inch row spacing and they go out and harvest the wheat off and then they're left with soybeans. And it's a tremendous idea. You've got great weed suppression and you get two crops out of one year. So there's always things we can consider. Okay, the next one is, what is one of your biggest failures farming regeneratively and what did you learn or improve on it in the following years? Great question, great question. Biggest failure is weeds, weeds got out of control and, and took a bean field, but I know why. It goes back to what I mentioned earlier that it is imperative that we get the cover crops established in a timely fashion in the fall. Now, we I wanna give you two examples here. We had a field this fall that was absolutely, I mean, 98% weed free. It was better than our neighbor's fields who sprayed four times. Now, let's start thinking about why. The cereal rye on that field was planted on September the 10th. We had tremendous growth in the fall. We had great tillering in the spring and we had almost 7,000 pounds of biomass and we had a beautiful field all the way to harvest. Okay, here comes the example of the, and, and I don't like to use the word failure because that's too negative of a word. I like to say things like outcomes we did not expect because Believe me, there are so many things happening here. Mother Nature has thrown you so many curveballs. You, you're gonna, you can get yourself drugged down in a rut and you're going to start thinking that, oh my gosh, what I'm doing is not working. What is wrong with me? So take failure out of your vocabulary. But here's what happened. Let's go down the road now from that field. Let's go three miles down the road. Same, same soil type, same area, same topography but the cocktail or the, 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 the cereal rye didn't get planted until October 20th. The bean field yielded 30. So to me, that is not good enough, but it was due to the fact we didn't have the biomass and we did not hold the weeds. So that is the biggest, I don't wanna use the word failure, but that's the biggest disappointment that we had but I think I've got the answers why. So again, shorten relative maturity, uh, use cereal grains to your advantage, uh, cattle grazing. We, we've, got, we've got 100 cows. We graze some of the farm. We don't have fence built everywhere, but those are perfect opportunities. Graze the cattle up until October, or I'm sorry, August 1st, and then get your cocktail planted. So we, we've got, I've given you four or five examples to take away those excuses that I live too far north, it's too cold here, I can't get it done. Great questions. All right, this one is, how does your system handle weather extremes, wet and dry? Yeah, you know, it, 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 it gets difficult. Um, the, biggest, the biggest threat to me is a wet fall because then of what I've just explained. We can't get the stuff planted when we want to. But remember, there's almost always an out. Two years ago, we did not finish harvesting until December 14th. And what, what I decided in that fall 
was we are going to put every person available and we're going to dedicate them to harvest because we still had 1500 acres to get out and the weather was going to go south on us it was going to get snow and it was going to get ugly and it was going to be rainy and wet and then freeze and thaw and and i said no we're going to get the crop out and we're not going to worry about planting cover crops because the, the grounds barely fit anyway okay so we get done December the 14th, we're, we've got 1500 acres of cereal rye that did not get drilled. We have a Case IH 70 foot air boom. And we went out right after Christmas when the ground froze and we broadcast 100 pounds to the uh, acre of Elbon cereal rye. Just broadcast it right over the top. Never done this before. Didn't know if this was gonna work. It did work. The cereal rye did vernalize and it did come out next spring and it grew to be six feet tall and we laid it down and and did we have as good of a weed suppression as if we would have gotten it planted in September? No, but it was better than not doing anything at all. So the wet fall worries me way more than a wet spring. But yes, we we do have to worry about those situations and and folks if you want to if you want to go no till sell all your tillage equipment because then you don't have anything to go till with and so with that in mind we don't have any more equipment so we can't rut our fields up so it becomes a patience game you have to become very patient all right we still have a lot of questions but we'll try to get through a few more how do you terminate alfalfa in a no-till environment without using chemicals? Great question, great question. Okay, let's go back to my 70-30 rule of 70% 70 of that cover crop is gonna suppress the weeds and the 30% is gonna come from the cash crop canopy. Okay, here's what we do. We no-till corn into standing alfalfa and that alfalfa is around 30 inches tall when this is happening. So that's the easy part. Okay, then, then what we do is at V1, so six or seven days later, we're gonna come in with that I and J roller crimper and we're gonna roll the field flat because when that alfalfa is 30 inches tall and you drive on it, it's gonna just flatten it. Now, we know that this is not gonna terminate the alfalfa. We know that. You've gotta kill the crown to terminate alfalfa. But what this is doing is buying time for the corn to get out through that canopy that we just laid down, wiggle itself up through that and start reaching for the sky and taking off. Okay, when this happens without any mother nature problems like army worms or black cut worms or no rain, when you can get this to happen, the corn will take off and it will get to canopy. So now we're uh, at that 70-30 rule. The, up to that point, the alfalfa has suppressed the weeds and now the corn is at canopy. And again, that's why I'm gonna stay on 20 inch corn row spacing because this canopy is important. The canopy is now suffocating and smothering that alfalfa and actually terminating it. We have been doing this now for three years. We're somewhere in that 90 to 95 percent total termination of the alfalfa by the cash crop canopy. I know that sounds crazy, but it is it's working. It, we again, we have not perfected this, but we're getting better and better at this all the time. Now, I, this is dangerous, folks. I mean, we're talking about planting a warm season grass of corn into a well-established perennial alfalfa. That's almost suicide. So please, if you're going to do this, go slow and do only a few acres. But this can work. If, you know, I can, maybe one day we could do another, another video series here, but I did not put any of these videos in because I didn't have enough time. But it's amazing what we can do if you just get creative. So great question. The cash crop canopy of the corn is suffocating and terminating that alfalfa. All right. 
Next one. When does nitrogen start to become available from the dead rye? In your table, it looks like none was released even two months after termination. Yeah, about 50 pounds had, re had been released. You know, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, though. You, you sparked my, my brain thinking here. I no longer do that test uh, on a height basis. I do that test now every Monday of the, of the growing season, and we take it all the way to harvest. So now we've got, what, 50 of these tests or 60 maybe? So, um, well, no, not that many, like 25 tests. So now what I need to do is go back and, and collate that information and see where that rye, what date was that rye when it exhausted that nitrogen. But no, I do not have the answer to that. But that would be good to know because if you were going to bring, let's say, corn behind this, there may be available nitrogen coming from that cereal rye that that corn plant could get a hold of. Or if you're going to plant another cover crop, there might be fuel coming from that dead cereal rye that's going to feed that cover crop you just planted to help get it established. So I, I, I can't honestly answer your question because I don't have the, the evidence in front of me. But by understanding the system, my guess is, Yes, that nitrogen is slower to release, but somewhere along this system, something is taking advantage of that nitrogen. Okay, next one. Have you ever experienced cereal rye plugging tile lines? No, I've been asked that many times. I, you know, knock on wood, I hope that doesn't happen. I've heard of it happening and I've heard of people just having fits where they have to just dig tile up and lay in new lines, but no, I, I've not seen that happen, no. And, and, that's, and that's also with, with two-year uh, 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 alfalfa. I mean, those roots go 10, 12, 14 feet deep. So I don't know why, but um, you know, maybe we do and I'm, not, I'm unaware of it, but as far as I know, we've not ever had anything plugged up because of, of roots. All right, have you ever used a rolling basket to roll crimp the rye? No, but I think it would work. That goes back to what I said earlier. If you don't have the, if you don't have an I and J roller at the beginning, that's fine. I'm going to bet you've got something that will work. And yes, I would think a rolling basket would work. What we have to remember is when we're rolling the cereal rye down at anthesis, that's dropping pollen. The lignin in the in the cereal rye is at its highest and that makes the plant very brittle. So you could drive over it with your pickup and roll it down and lay it flat and it's done. So yes, I'm pretty confident that a rolling basket, a cul de mulcher, uh, some people have, land, I think they're called land rollers, those smooth barrel rollers. I think any of that would work. But the, the key here though, is if you're going to plant the beans at boot stage like we are, and then roll this down when the beans are at V2, please go 100 feet and stop and make sure you're not tearing your beans up too bad. But other than that, yes, it's a go. It, it would be a go. Okay, here's a good one. When you are 100% organic, will you still be able to raise alfalfa and use manure? Yes, yes, that's a very good question. Okay, here's my advice if you want to go organic. Find an organic certifier before you start and have a meeting with them and make sure that you tell them everything that you are going to do and get their approval of any products that you wanna apply. That's what we did. I said, hey, look, we've got this dairy. Will you let us, and it's, it's not an organic dairy. It is a non-GMO dairy, but it's not organic. And I asked the certified agency, would you accept using this solid manure in our organic system? And they uh, took samples and then they, they had a meeting about it and they, they concluded, yes, we will allow you to, to do this, but the only caveat they gave us was if we were going to raise 
food grade, we could not apply it within a certain amount of time of harvest. I think it's 90 days because they don't want to have any contamination for the food aspect. But yes, it, again, if you're going to think about organic, please locate your certifier before you do, because look, you got to do this for three years. So if, wouldn't it be a bummer if you were doing this for three years and then you call the certifier and say, hey, I'm ready to certify my farm. And they say, okay, what have you been doing? And they say, nope, sorry, that's not a, a, a product that we accept. You got to start all over. So do your due diligence up front. Sorry, I was muted. We're gonna do one more question and then uh, Mary will put that CCA code back up again. Okay. Um, I'm, this one says, I'm coming from a landlord position. The current farm operation is corn and soybeans and has been no-tilled for 30 years. Mm. Cover crops have been used the last three years. In your opinion, is it fair to request to ask this tenant to incorporate 25% of their cropland into a small grain so that a cover crop could be established and provide more benefit? Um, I think that's worth the conversation. If you like the tenant though, tenants, good tenants are hard to find sometimes. I wouldn't press the issue too hard, but here's what we have to remember. Is there a market on where your farm is for wheat? And if there's not, then you cannot ask them to, to raise something that there's not a market for. But in my opinion, if you can start to reduce the inputs and start saving money on that aspect, you then can afford to not double crop soybeans into that wheat acre. So then yes, I would ask them to plant wheat so that you can get a, an established cover crop in a timely fashion. Because I'm telling you, we, we've got to stop looking at just a single year snapshot of profitability or ROI. We have to stop doing that. What we have to start doing is, is taking the income from all of these years of the cash crop rotation and then dividing that by that number. Because then you will start to see that that regen year makes sense or raising wheat without double cropping soybeans makes sense because the cover crop that you've established is going to be a huge benefit to the next cash crop that you plant next spring. Again, I don't want to get the farmer in trouble here, but if you like the tenant and you want to continue to work with them and you have a wheat market, I would ask them if they would consider planting some wheat. Yes. And again, Rick, we really appreciate everything you did. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It was an honor. Thank you.